All right, I'm going to be talking to us next about erosion of rock and soil. And uh, I know I'm between us and lunch, so I'm going to try to make this as interesting as possible. Hopefully nobody gets up and leaves before I finish. We got a structural guy in the back of the room getting coffee. We're about to talk about erosion of rock and soil. I mean, come on. What the heck? It's like, this doesn't apply to me. I, I, it doesn't matter. I would never. I'm not a barbarian. All right, so erosion of rock and soil. Pretty important topic, right? If we don't have erosion of rock and soil, then our dams and levees are going to be there forever. We don't have any problems. But that's not the case. So our objectives for this presentation, we're going to be explaining the principles and methodologies for characterizing and developing input parameters to models, erosion models, for estimating the erosion of rock and soil. And we're going to apply information that will help us estimate probabilities uh, of erosion initiation that lead to failure under various potential failure modes. So we're going to be talking about, as the title of the presentation suggests, rock erosion and soil erosion. So first, let's start off with a general overview of the erosion process. What does erosion look like? So how, how does it initiate? Erosion generally initiates during periods of high flow velocity or uh, increased flow depths that causes soil or rock particle detachment, plucking, scour, and transport. However, it's important to note that high velocity in and of itself doesn't guarantee that erosion is going to initiate. It's also dependent on the physical characteristics of whatever material the water is flowing over. So whatever materials that or characteristics that that rock or soil has, it's going to define whether or not the, the flow velocity or flow depth is sufficient to initiate erosion. Typically, erosion is going to initiate when we have adverse surface conditions that allow flows to concentrate and change the flow regime to a turbulent flow. So if we just have laminar flow, we have gentle flow, we're not likely to, to cause a lot of erosion, right? So we need some sort of adverse conditions that create um, turbulent flow. Some examples of that, topographic breaks and slopes. So let's say we have an embankment where there is a, a berm. So we hit that change in slope that causes the flow to, uh, it changes the flow regime, leads to some turbulence. And then we have a whole lot of others. I'm not sure why that one had its own line, but geez. So what else could it be? It could be obstacles or deflectors. We have trees, boulders, vegetation, guardrails. Uh, we could have contrasting cover materials. Let's say we transition from an asphalt road surface to a grass embankment slope. Let's say we have a grass embankment slope and a rock embankment toe. When we have those changes in materials, we change the roughness, we, um, we create those turbulent conditions, those are adverse flow effects that, that cause us to begin erosion. So the typical head cut erosion process, <clears throat> first we, we have, let's say we have a, a grassy slope. So we could have some flaws that exist in that protective cover. So like I said, those are going to be those adverse surface conditions that create that turbulent flow. If we just have a uniform grass slope, there's not really anywhere for the flow to cause any problems. But if we have some, uh, there's, you can kind of see it here. There's just a little bit patchy. The grass is a little bit uneven. Or if we have some, some bare patches in that slope, flow is going to hit those like it is right here, and that flow is going to concentrate. That change in surface roughness is going to concentrate the flow. We're going to start to see some of those. You can see the, the white caps there, the little eddies, the little turbulence there. And eventually, that's going to create a situation where we form a head cut. So right here, you can see the, the water is falling off. We have a little bit of a head cut developing. So that's the, those are the first stages of initiation, right? We have that first little bit of particle uh, detachment and then we have a head cut that forms and then eventually we have that head cut advancing upstream as we have enough flow duration that head cut will advance upstream and eventually will reach whatever control point we have if that's the spillway control if that's the upstream portion of an embankment crest there's not a picture on this slide of that last stage in the process that breaching process but that is the 
the ultimate, right, the ultimate ending to the original process is we have a head cut that advances upstream and we have a breach. I want to make a note that uh, this process can also occur in cohesionless soils. These figures are, are really specific to cohesion or cohesive soils where we can actually develop that head cut. In a cohesive soil, we may not have a head cut that forms, right? We could have surface erosion, we could have some progressive sloughing, so we can still have this process in a cohesionless soil. It'll just look a little bit different. Let's talk about erosion mechanisms. So we need a few things to really get us to scour. There's a few different components that are involved, right? So the first one is that turbulence production that we've been talking about. That can happen in a number of ways. We could have impinging jet, a submerged jet, back roller, hydraulic jump. We could have some eddies form at some surface boundaries. This figure here is for an impinging jet. It's just specific to an impinging jet, but we're going to talk a little bit more about some of these other uh, mechanisms in a couple of slides. The next thing we need is particle detachment. So we say here that there's a, there's a node that says cohesive material, but that can also occur in cohesionless material, right? So I want to go back to this last slide. Here's an example. It's just a, a graphical example of what we just talked about a second ago, right? That head cut process. So in cohesive soils, this is, this is what it looks like. So we have flow over uh, a slope. We have a head cut that forms, and then the head cut advances. In cohesionless soils, we have that flow. We have more of a progressive eating away of the embankment, if you will, until eventually there's just nothing left. So it looks a little bit different, but that's the particle detachment piece of the puzzle, right? So it can be a, a brittle or fatigue failure. We can have block removal where we're talking about rock erosion. We can have, you know, blocks of rock being removed. We can have abrasion where we have one material that's maybe rubbing against another material. You can think of perhaps some, some ball milling applications or something like that, where you have one material that's just rolling along and abrading against the material under it or over top of it or next to it, and is causing some material removement. Or we can have a tensile block failure. And then finally, we have particle breakup and transport. So we detach the particle, we've got the flow, we initiate erosion, we've detached particles. Well, okay, now we need to remove them. So there's another little piece of the puzzle uh, right at the very end. We have to take those particles and we have to get them out of there. So uh, that can be break up transport. Um, there's a phenomenon called armoring that we're going to talk about as well. But that removal process is what creates that ultimate scour hole. So you think of a classic scour hole, uh, say in a, a stilling basin or downstream of a, still, of a stilling basin foundation uh, where you have a, a, a hole that's formed in rock. We have to remove those eroded particles to create that scour hole. So let's talk a little bit about uh, back rollers and head cuts. I mentioned this a few slides ago. <clears throat> so let's say we have a harder material, such as maybe a, a spillway slab or a hard rock ledge. You can see that right there. And we have flow that's moving over top of that rock ledge. And we have a plunging jet. So that plunging jet is coming down, it's hitting the material below it. Well, what's going to happen is that jet is going to split. Part of it's going to go downstream, part of it's going to go upstream. So that's that part that splits off and goes upstream, that's called a back roller. So you have that erosive energy that's, that's splitting off, it's moving upstream, and with enough energy, you can create um, erosion on that vertical face. You can be begin to erode that vertical face and then advance the head cut upstream with that mechanism. And what will happen is you will advance enough upstream that you get this overhang and then eventually that overhang is going to run out of support and it may collapse. Now what can happen if you have large enough materials that collapse into that hole, let's say you have a, a very intact rock ledge or you have a heavily reinforced uh, spillway slab or something like that, it can fall down into that hole. And if it stays intact and doesn't get removed, you can have this phenomenon called armoring. So this is an, an example of armoring where you just have materials that fall down into the scour hole and it actually ends up preventing additional erosion. 
right? You can add some resistance there. It's, it's like adding protection against the vertical face so that that back wall or that erosion or that water can attack more and more material. Now, that may not stop the erosion process altogether. You may eventually have enough flow or you may break that material up and be able to move it downstream. Uh, but it will slow the process. So when you're thinking about it in terms of a potential failure mode, thinking about event duration, thinking about possible intervention, that can be an important part of the process. If it, if it slows things down enough, it can create additional time that requires, that the PFM requires to get to failure. All right, let's get into some rock erosion considerations. So the first consideration for rock erosion and for soil erosion, but for rock erosion for now is the erosive power of the water. Right, remember that's the first step. Have to have enough erosion potential in the water flow to begin erosion of the material. So how much ener energy does that water flowing down a slope actually have? So another presenter uh, for this topic describes this water as angry water. He likes to describe it as angry water. So you, you think in a, in a whitewater rafting scenario, you know, you're in a, a gentle, gentle little stream flow, and then boom, you hit a rapid, right? That water is angry, he would say. So how angry is the water? Uh, and where is it the most angry? So that's what we're trying to figure out, and that's what stream power calculations help us to do. Stream power is calculated as a rate of energy dissipation against a surface. We're going to go through three different applications of stream power. The first one is flow down a uniform slope. So if you have a flow down a uniform slope, like a spillway slope, uh, an unlined spillway slope, or something like that, or even an embankment, you can calculate the stream power, and it's a function of the unit weight of the water, the flow velocity, the water depth, and the hydraulic energy grade slope line. So we'll be using this equation in our exercise, which we're going to be doing after lunch, when we put some of these principles into application to evaluate potential for rock erosion. So the second equation is for a plunging jet. A plunging jet. So remember before I was talking about that figure being for a plunging jet. This is where you would have water. This, this figure shows water flowing over a dam, but it could be water flowing over uh, a drop off in a spillway or any of those applications that we talked about before. Anywhere really where we have water falling into a downstream area, you would have a plunging jet. So this one is a function of the unit weight of water, the unit discharge, the fall height, uh, waterfall height, and then the thickness of the jet as it reaches the surface. The final one we're going to be talking about is the back roller. So how do you calculate the energy that forms from that plunging jet that splits off and goes upstream? This is what that equation would look like. It's a function of unit weight of water, the unit flow rate in the upstream direction, the average water velocity in the pool, and the acceleration due to gravity. Now you can imagine unit flow rate in upstream direction. That's a little bit difficult to calculate. There's probably going to be some uncertainty in that, right? So it's, it's going to be challenging to calculate that, but there is a mechanism for calculating it. All right, so then particle detachment. What are the applications, what are the methodologies or the methods that we have for calculating the, the likelihood of rock erosion? We know what the erosive power of our water is. We know how angry it is. So how do we know if that anger is enough to overcome the resisting force of the rock? Well, there's several different concepts that we have that we can use to evaluate this. So I'm going to go a few, uh, through a few on this slide, and we're going to cover one in detail in the presentation. So the first one was developed by Bollard. This is uh, the comprehensive scour model, so that he developed a physics-based method that evaluates failure propagation and block movement of the rock. However, it does come with some limitations. His method assumes that all of the rock blocks are cubic or rectangular in shape, and removal occurs by lifting only. So that lifting, he's taking these, these very uniform rock blocks and lifting them out of the rock mass. So it does come with some limitations. Next method is uh, the Annandale method. This is developed by George Annandale. 
It's a semi-empirical method that uh, was calibrated with over 150 field and case studies. So what he did is he went to erosion sites, he looked at a rock mass, he calculated a stream power that was applied to that rock mass, and then he derived what he uh, called the head cut erodibility index of that rock. He developed or derived the, the ability of the rock to resist erosion based on those characteristics. So that rock um, erodibility index is a function of Kirsten's ripability index and also Burton's, um, let's see, Burton's Q rate. Burton, I can't come up with the words. It's on the next slide. I'll get there in a second. We're going to talk about this one in more detail. Sorry, forgot what I was talking about. So this methodology can be applied to both rock and soil, actually, but it's more commonly applied to rock. And as I'm going to discuss in a second, this is the method that we use at the core to evaluate the potential for rock erosion, maybe for a spillway failure mode or, or any other potential failure modes that include rock erosion. All right, the next method was developed by Mike George. He's actually a colleague of George Annandale, and he applied the block theory concept to block removability and block jointing. So he actually used that method to predict which blocks in the rock mass would be removed during flow. He kind of advanced the concept of discontinuity and block orientation relative to erosion, but um, this methodology is also a little bit limited because it's, it's currently limited to only evaluating a few individual blocks in a rock mass. So it makes it difficult to, to really apply it on a large scale. And then one more method, uh, more recently, Pels developed a semi-empirical method that's similar to the Annandale method, but he used a different rock classification system in his method. So he's using the geological strength index, which is derived by the hook brown rock mass classification system. So he still applies a discontinuity function, uh, but it's based on a different data set than Annandale's method, and it has a little bit of a different application. And like I said before, the Annandale erodibility index method is, is the one that we currently use in our risk assessment toolbox that we discussed in this course. So you remember that I discussed the availability of our toolboxes uh, yesterday during the intro presentation. If you look in the spillway erosion suite on the RMC website, you'll be able to find the head cut erodibility toolbox that uses the Annandale method. So let's talk about it in a little bit more detail. The erodibility index, or KH, like I said, is based on Kirsten's trippability index and Barton's Q rock mass classification system. So Kirsten developed rock mass parameters from the field and lab data that he used uh, to correlate how easy it was to rip or tear through a rock mass. And then Barton's system was designed for tunneling, tunnel support, and considers parameters such as rock quality designation, or RQD, joint condition, joint spacing, rock spacing, et cetera. So Annandale then combined the two to estimate rock mass resistance. So the head cut erodibility index, or KH, is made up of four parameters. So the first one is MS, and MS is the mass strength number. The mass strength number is a uh, function of the unconfined compressive strength of the rock. Next one is the block size number, or KB, and this is a function of the rock quality designation, and then the number of joint sets. So think about the number of joint sets. Uh, the block size number corresponds to how intact the rock is, and then how large the, the size of the rock blocks are. Next is KD, discontinuity shear strength number. So this is a function of the joint roughness number and the joint alteration number. So the joint roughness is a, a function of the degree of, of the roughness of opposing um, sides of the opposing faces of the rock continuity. So you think if you have a, a very rough uh, surface between the two continuities or between the, the continuity faces, it's going to be a little bit harder to move that block. But if you have more of an open joint or 
they're smooth in nature, then it's going to be easier for, for those blocks to move past each other. And then the joint alteration represents the degree of alteration of the materials that form the face of the discontinuity. So this is where we're going to be talking about is the joint infilled. What, is the, what are the properties of the infilling of that discontinuity? And how does that affect how easy it is to remove those blocks? So together, the KD and KB parameters, uh, and I, I want to stress before we move on, we're going to be talking about another KD in a few slides as it pertains to soil erosion. This is a different KD, and I'll say that again when we get to the soil erosion because it's very important. Same term, but very different meaning. Confusing? Yes. Important? Yes. We'll talk why in a few slides. But together, the KB and the KD parameters represent the, uh, the ground mass. And then finally, the final term is the relative ground structure number, or JS. So this represents the relative ability of the earth material to resist erosion due to the structure of the ground. So this is a function of the dip and the dip direction of the rock in relation to the flow. So if you think about it, I don't have a figure up on the screen, but if you, if you picture a rock that's dipping in this direction and the flow is moving this way, this is not a great orientation because the water is going to be able to push the block. However, if it's this way and the flow is moving this way, that's more favorable in terms of, of rock erosion and rock removal because it's less likely that that water is going to be able to, to influence that block. So that's really what the relative ground structure number is getting at. So this slide has a, a lot of tables and I'm not going to go through what all of those tables say right now. There's an excellent figure, I forgot that was in there. This is a, a good representation of what I was just talking about with the relative ground structure number. But essentially each of these parameters of the head cut erodibility index can be derived from a bunch of tables. In our exercise, we're going to be walking through this process of calculating erodibility index for two types of rocks. So you're going to have plenty of opportunity to wade your way through this and get nice and confused with all the numbers and all the tables and all the information. But hopefully, at the end of it, you'll have a better idea of where those parameters are coming from, what they mean, and how they affect the ability of the or the resistance of the rock to erosion. So at the end of the day, we have an erodibility index, head cut erodibility index, and an applied stream power. We can use those terms and plug them into this graph to determine how likely it is that we're going to get erosion. It's a little bit difficult to see. The lighting doesn't make it easy, but the shading of this graph down here where it says no scour, this is green, and scour is red, so of course green is good and red means bad. Uh, hopefully that's easier to see in the slides that you were able to download. But uh, this chart was developed through empirical correlations uh, for approximately 150 case studies. So those 150 case studies that Annandale looked through, he then correlated all those to put together this chart. And he was able to draw a a threshold line. So this black dotted line right here is the Annandale threshold line. So it's referred to Annandale threshold line. If you plot above the line, like I said, likely that scour is going to occur. If you plot below the line, it's likely that scour is not going to occur. In 2005, Rubero developed probabilistic aggression line, regression lines using that same data set. And uh, he was able to put together these regression line estimates that associate or that um, give a probability of rock erosion. So it makes it a little bit more prescriptive. You end up with more of a number rather than a relative point on a chart. You will notice that the Annandale threshold line and the 50% probability line are a little bit different. That's because when Weibo did his analysis, he excluded uh, from his data set <coughs> Uh, points where the, the 
head cut erodibility index was less than 0.1. So that kind of skewed things a little bit in his data set, but they're, they're very close. You can see that they're very close. And what we're not showing on this slide is there is a big, long equation that you're going to be plugging all of your numbers into that's a function of head cut erodibility index and stream power to arrive at an actual probability, an estimated probability of erosion occurring. All right, everybody's an expert on rock erosion now, right? Structural guy gives me a thumbs up. That means I did a good job. I gave the structural folks an equation, and that's all that they need. They need equations. Okay, good. So let's move. Yeah, go ahead. In a way, yes, it's, um, there are some simplifying assumptions that are being made, and that's the, that's the purpose of all of the different parameters in the head cut erodibility index, which are going to be looking for, similar to um, like a soil erosion we'll talk about in a second, if you're looking at a, a big spillway with a large 2D area, you know, hopefully you can, you can zone in on the area of the greatest susceptibility. So when we talk about some of the parameters that go into that head cut erodibility index, you're going to want to be focusing on the, the worst case scenario. So the discontinuity that is going to provide the least or, uh, resistance to erosion. So it's kind of one way of, of getting around that. But, but yes, you're essentially assuming that the entire mass has those properties. You can certainly do the analysis in multiple locations to see how the results change. Um, and if that matters for your potential failure mode, that would definitely be encouraged. Okay, let's discuss some soil erosion characteristics. So there are multiple variables that play a role in determining if the erosion of soil will occur. So first, just as with rock erosion, you need water. You need water to erode soil. If you don't have any water, you don't have any problem. If you don't have any water, then I don't know why we have a dam or a levee there in the first place, but I guess we can go and ask the people on the West Coast why we have so many dry dams out there. Eventually, the water will come, right? So you need water. First of all, you need water. But then um, other variables, shear stress, flow velocity, material type, the geometry, armoring, vegetation, soil properties, those all play a role in determining whether soil erosion are going to occur. So just as with rock erosion, we start with calculating the erosive capacity of the flowing water. So with rock erosion, we use stream power. For soil erosion, we primarily look at shear stress. Shear stress is the, the biggest uh, parameter that plays the role into whether we are going to initiate erosion or not. So shear stress, um, yeah, I just said the often used to determine if material will erode. So this is the equation that we use to calculate the hydraulic shear stress in a channel. So if you have something like spillway erosion where you, you have a soil line spillway, uh, you would use this equation. It's a function of unit weight of water, the hydraulic radius of the bed, or otherwise known as the cross-sectional area of flow divided by everyone's favorite term, wetted perimeter, and then the energy slope. So what we do for soil erosion is we calculate the shear stress that's going to be imparted on the soil by the flow, and we compare it to the critical shear stress of the soil. So we compare stream power to head cut erodibility index for rock. We compare shear stress to critical shear stress for soil. So this is the equation for flow down a, a uniform channel. Now this equation is for flow through a flaw in an embankment, such as a pipe or a crack. So this has more of an internal erosion application. These, uh, this equation and several others like it are what we would use for an internal erosion application where we have a flaw through an embankment and we have concentrated flow or concentrated leakage, concentrated leak erosion that can apply a shear stress to the soil that surrounds it. So this slide shows the equation for calculating hydraulic shear stress through a 
rectangular crack. Um, and when all is said and done, when all is said and done, it's really it's similar to the equation that's shown on this slide. It's just a little bit different. The energy slope line is replaced with the gradient and the crack. But if you look at the equation pretty closely, you're going to see that a lot of the same terms still apply. And there are several other applications, such as flow through a horizontal crack. This one's for a vertical crack. There's flow through a horizontal crack. There's flow through a tapered crack, so more of a V crack that might develop during a, a seismic event or something like that. And then flow through a cylindrical pipe. And these applications are all included in our internal erosion toolboxes on the RMC website. Uh, the Concentrated Leak Erosion Initiation Toolbox has all those different applications that are available for use. All right, so this slide introduces the concept of soil detachment coefficient or erodibility coefficient, which is KD. So remember, KD, not the same KD from Annandale, different KD. And when it comes to soil, this is about as important as it gets. This is going to be the critical parameter for detachment coefficient if you're evaluating something like overtopping erosion. This is going to determine how quickly your soil is going to erode. There are correlations that have been drawn between erodibility and critical shear stress, and we use those as a means to classify the materials, uh, the erodibility of materials from soil to rock. So it can be used for rock, but again, just like stream power and heck of erodibility index is mostly used for rock, this one's mostly used for soil. So the figure on the left demonstrates the process for determining the KD of a soil. So what you'll do is run several tests. You will run a test on a soil. You will apply a specific shear stress, and then you will measure the rate of erosion based on that shear stress. And then you will run that test several more times until you can develop a trend line. And the slope of that line defines the value of erodibility coefficient. And the steeper the slope, the, uh, the higher the erosion rate, and the gentler the slope, the lower erosion rate. So the higher the, the slope, the more erodible your material is. The gentler the slope, the less erodible your material is. And then the figure on the right displays the correlation between hydraulic shear stress and erodibility coefficient. This is an SI unit from Hansen and Simon. <clears throat> so it correlates shear stress on the x-axis and erodibility coefficients on the y-axis. And using those correlations, we were able to bin materials into different erosion categories. Now these are qualitative erosion categories, resistant, very resistant, moderately resistant, erodible, and very erodible. And then one more note down here, dispersive soils are kind of a special case that may be extremely erodible and are not represented on this chart. Dispersive soils are just kind of a special animal, right? So uh, a lot of these concepts, a lot of these uh, relationships, they, they may not apply to dispersive soils. If you have potentially dispersive soils at your site or in a PFM that you're evaluating, Keep that in mind and know that it's a special case. So since relationships for erodibility coefficient and uh, are as a function of shear stress and rate of erosion have been established, we can use all of our erodibility parameters, our critical shear stress and our um, erodibility coefficient to estimate the rate of erosion for a soil um, given a, a, a hydraulic load. So these equations here, volume erosion and mass erosion, we use these a lot when we quantitatively evaluate whether breach will occur. So let's say you have a, a pipe through an embankment for a, a backward erosion piping failure motor. You have a concentrated leak in an embankment. Uh, once you have connected to the reservoir, you have that reservoir head, you want to know how quickly that material is going to erode to determine, do I have enough duration? Do I have enough flow? Can I really progress this to a breach? That's where these equations are going to come in. So they're functions of erodibility coefficient for volume erosion or a coefficient of soil erosion for mass erosion, and then um, the shear stress applied by the flow and the critical shear stress of the soil. All right, so soil erodibility. 
we know how it was calculated, but what are the, the test methods? How did we get those data points? <clears throat> so this figure on the left shows the jet erosion test concept uh, and setup. So this test apparatus was developed by Greg Hansen at the USDA's Agricultural Research Service. And it was initially developed for stream bed erosion, but it was then also applied to spillway erosion, overtopping erosion, and concentrated leak erosion. So in the jet test, a jet of water is directed at a soil sample, and the rate of removal of the soil is measured. And then the applied shear stress is defined by the test setup, so the critical shear stress of the soil and the erodibility coefficient of the soil can be determined based on the results. So it's a pretty good test. This next example shows the hull erosion test concept and setup. So this test was developed by Juan and Fell, Juan and Fell at the University of New South Wales, and it's a it's a faster and more economic um, alternative to a different type of test, the slot erosion test, uh, for concentrated leak erosion. So this test primarily applies to concentrated leak erosion applications. So in the in the hull erosion test, a cylindrical sample through which a hole has been initially drilled, hole erosion test, drill a hole, so it makes sense. It's placed into an apparatus and then water is passed through the sample. And then the enlargement of the, the hole is measured. Um, and that's done by measuring the, the rate of loss of soil. So they capture the soil and they, they measure it as it's being lost. Uh, and that can be used to determine different erodibility coefficients. So uh, these are just two tests. There's, there's several other test methods that are not included in this presentation that are, are used for a, a whole lot of different applications. But we also have an erodibility parameters toolbox. Again, that's in the internal erosion suite of toolboxes on the RMC website. And you will see in there that <clears throat> data sets from, from many different types of tests, the jet erosion test, the whole erosion test, the erosion function apparatus, EFA tests. We'll, I think I mentioned that in the next slide or so. Those are all included in that toolbox. Um, so you can, you can use the results of all those tests to determine or estimate erodibility coefficients or erodibility parameters for your soils. So we have all these results from, from jet and HET testing. What do we do with them? Well, this is what we do with them. Of course, we plot them. We're engineers, we plot everything. So we have critical shear stress and detachment rate coefficient. And Hansen and Simon in 2001 developed, an, uh, developed a relationship to correlate critical shear stress and uh, erodibility coefficient. So this is based on 61 laboratory whole erosion test results. 47 lab and field jet erosion test results. Uh, these were all performed by reclamation since about 2007. And an interesting note, the hole erosion tests in general exhibit lower detachment rate coefficients, which is an interesting <clears throat> caveat to, to keep in mind when you're thinking about which data set you're comparing your materials to. Uh, but in general, we can see that the the best fit line that's proposed by Hansen and Simon in 2001, that blue line, um, it, it still looks pretty good. Um, this relationship is, like I said, it's from 2001. It's actually been superseded. We need to update this graph. There is a new relationship that Hansen or that Simon at all developed in 2011, and it has a little bit steeper slope. So it really follows more along that path right there. More like that. Uh, so that is a, an updated relationship that, that we just need to update on this slide. But again, if you look at the erodibility parameters toolbox on the RMC website, it has that updated relationship in it. So as it can be seen from the results, the erodibility coefficient and the critical shear stress are inversely related. Um, so as critical shear stress goes up, erodibility coefficient goes down which makes sense because a lower erodibility coefficient means a soil is more erodible. And if a soil has a higher critical shear stress, it's going to be, mm, I'm sorry. God, I still get that mixed up in my own mind. The lower the erodibility coefficient, the less erodible the soil. Higher critical shear stress, the less erodible the soil. There we go. 
Um, but another thing to call out here is that erodibility coefficient and critical shear stress, they vary by orders of magnitude. Orders of magnitude. So you can see for moderately resistant erosion right here, if you trace these trend lines down, the, the orders of magnitude difference in some of these results and the parameters is, is very large. So don't get hung up on trying to estimate a value. When you're talking about erodibility coefficient in particular, but also for critical shear stress, you're looking more at ranges. You're not looking at numbers. You're looking at ranges. And if you run some sensitivity and find a, a fairly large range in some of these parameters for a given soil, don't freak out. That's okay. It's, it's usually what happens. So what factors affect erosion resistance in the soil? Compaction water content. Uh, we see from this slide that there's a, a general trend that as water content increases, the value of erodibility coefficient decreases, particularly for finer soils. However, water content showed a negative effect on erosion resistance of coarse grain soils in EFA testing or erosion function apparatus testing. So while this slide shows that there may be some correlation, <coughs> In general, it, it doesn't seem like that is really true. It doesn't seem like there's a, a genuine correlation between water content alone and erosion resistance. All right, what about plasticity? So generally, erosion resistance increases with an increase in plasticity index for both coarse grain soils and fine grain soils. But this is especially true for soils with a D50 of less than 0.3 millimeters. So in fine grain soils, erosion resistance increases with an increase in the, uh, in the plastic limit of that soil. Now this increase uh, or this influence is more pronounced in the EFA testing than it was in the JET or the HET testing. Then finally, what about the proportion of erodible and resistant materials in the soils? The overall composition of the material can have an influence on erosion resistance. So <clears throat> if you have larger gravel and cobble pieces within an erodible matrix, it can have an effect on the KD, provided that those larger particles have surface contact and can transfer stress from one particle to another. So if those larger particles can take on the, the load, so to speak, uh, the stress in the soil block, then it, it may have an influence on erodibility coefficient, even if you have a very erodible material on the inside of that soil structure. All right, so how do we model erosion? What are the different ways that we can model erosion? So one thing that we can do, one method that we're, we're using more is, is estimating flow, um, 2D flow velocities from HEC RAS and then comparing those estimated flow velocities to critical flow velocities of whatever material that we're flowing over, whether that be rock, whether that be soil, whether that be a, a vegetated slope. So we can compare um, our estimated velocities to critical channel velocities. And there's a table in EM 1110-2-1601 that provides some estimated critical velocities for different materials. So that EM is hydraulic design of flood control channels. Uh, these estimated 2D velocities can also be used to calculate an applied stream power to be used in comparison to Annandale's erodibility index, head cut erodibility index. So we can take these estimated flow velocities, use them to calculate a stream power, and then compare it against the KH of our materials. So one of the benefits of, of doing a, a study in this way is you can see we have a, a large unlined spillway or not concrete lined spillway, um, but we can use RAS to determine what the estimated flow velocity is in that entire 2D area. And we can have very accurate elevations in that spillway. We have LIDAR data, we have other um, sources of elevation data, and we can use that to really determine where our critical areas for velocity and erosion are going to be. So we can use that, like we can see up here, there's one localized area where we have high flow velocities where we don't along the rest of the spillway, and this is very close to the control point. So that may be a critical location for an unlined spillway potential failure mode. 
Right, WinDMC. WinDMC is another model that we can use to estimate the, the likelihood of erosion of a material. So, um, WinDAM is, it's good. It's a very good resource. It does have its limitations. It doesn't allow for multi-zone embankments. There are con some conservative uh, assumptions that are made in WinDAM. A head cut, if you're modeling dam embankment overtopping erosion, it'll assume that a head cut forms at the downstream crest of the embankment, where in reality you might initiate erosion more at a change in slope near the toe or at a piezometer stick up somewhere on the slope. Um, and it, it doesn't allow for a change in slope. You have to have a uniformly sloping embankment. Uh, but it does allow for you to model an entire embankment. It allows you to model spillways. And when Windam says spillways, it's not referring to unlined spillways. It's referring to what we would maybe call an outlet works or a gated spillway or, or something like that. But it allows you to, to have camber in the, in the embankment if there's some overbuild. You can really hone in on where uh, erosion is likely to occur, where overtopping erosion may initiate. So WinDAM is a, a, a very good um, tool that we can use to estimate erosion. Another example would be DL breach. DL breach is something that we've used uh, recently, and DL breach uh, has the advantage of allowing for the evaluation of a zoned embankment. You can have two zones in DL breach. I'm curious, are there any other models that anyone is aware of or has used to evaluate erosion? All right. No, they're either asleep, ready for lunch, or both. Or yes. Yeah, so, so WinDMC and uh, DL Breach, good tools that we can use to evaluate erosion, but we have to remember that they come with their own set of drawbacks. And just like everything else, some modeling things to remember, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I said that yesterday. All models are wrong, some are useful. Garbage in, garbage out. So if the inputs that you're putting into your modeling are bad, the results are likely going to be bad. Um, sites in Windham and even DL Breach may use terms that are familiar, but they might have different meanings, like what I was just referring to with uh, spillway. Windham has main spillway, auxiliary spillway, so it can be confusing um, if you're trying to apply it for one specific uh, scenario or one specific application. You just have to keep in mind that some of those terms may not be exactly what you are understanding them to be. Geometry and flow are as important as erodibility and other factors. So more than one alignment weight may be necessary. If you're modeling a, an unlined spillway, don't just focus on one alignment. Maybe run several different alignments. You might have some adverse geometry on the left side of the spillway that you don't have on the right side of the spillway. The input to the model will require data from a multidisciplinary team. So this is a, a good application of what Tom was discussing in the last presentation. Geotechs and geologists, we don't always see eye to eye, but it's important to get input from everyone that's involved to make sure that your, uh, your model results are accurate. But also for these overtopping models, you will need input from H and H team members because you need those hydrographs, you need that flow, those flow velocities, you need the flow durations. Remember, that's if you don't have any water, you don't have any erosion. So you want to make sure that you're modeling that accurately as well. Just because the model indicates that there's potential for failure, for failure, does not mean that the model fails. Remember, things like wind dam, there are conservative assumptions. So you have to take that into account. Maybe your embankment is larger than the one that you were able to model in Windam. Maybe erosion is not going to initiate right at the downstream crest. Keep those in mind. All right. Uh, run a full range of flows because duration is important. We have hydrographs for several different flood events. Run them all. <clears throat> KD and KH can heavily in, influence the output of these models, heavily. So erodibility coefficient and head cut erodibility index, like I said, they are the critical input parameters to these models. And they can vary by orders of magnitude. Run sensitivity. Please run sensitivity. If you don't hear anything else, hear that. Run sensitivity on these models. Do not just pick one and run it and think that that is the answer because it's not. Run sensitivity and then gauge 
how important those are. And if there's one other thing I want you to take from this presentation, it's this one. Assigning likelihood of initiation, progression, and failure takes judgment and interpretation of model results. Don't just take the answer and say, the model said so, the model made me do it. Wrong answer. Please don't do that. All right. We have some takeaways there. They're on the slides that you have. I won't talk through them. I've talked enough. Any do questions? We have any questions for Adam? The back. Oh, I'm coming to you. I would run, but I have a bad leg. Thank you. Um, on, will you go back to slide 35? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Why do you guys choose to use velocity versus like a shear stress? That's a good question. So you certainly could turn that velocity into a shear stress if you if you want to. So you can use that those equations for maybe a uniform channel. You just have to keep in mind that there are some limitations to that. You keep the, take the geometry of your spillway into account. But just as you can use the velocities to calculate a stream power, you could calculate an applied shear stress. Any other questions or comments? So just one note before we go to lunch, because um, Adam's uh, sensitivity analysis comment is a really important one. And uh, if you're doing the modeling and you do sensitivity on KD or KH, um, that's a really important thing to present to your team. So they understand what you looked at, the range of what you looked at, um, and uh, and the results, how it impacts the results. Um, so, you know, don't do your sensitivity in a cave by yourself and then decide what you think the answer is. Share that with your team so everybody can process what, um, alongside you, what your uncertainties were and how you got there. So, yeah. Regarding, um, I believe uh, regarding the, the soil erodibility, that was, I mean, you were looking at it through like a like a um, like a crack or some kind of um, you know um, you know fissure crack whatever. Is that would you do a different method for you know just basically like like sheet flow across like a a level a level uh, surface as opposed to through like uh, the crack? Well, the parameters are the same, right? For over for sheet flow versus in a crack, but what's different is, is the physics, right? So just like we're talking about um, in, a open, in a channel, uh, there are ways to calculate what the shear stress would be in that regard, the same here, whether it's in a concentrated leak or oversheet flow. Yeah, and if you remember, I, I said that the stream power erodibility index that can be applied to both rock and soil and vice versa for KD, so that that may be a good application for considering, okay, well, maybe it's gonna be difficult for me to calculate an applied shear stress from a sheet flow. Maybe I can calculate a stream power based on my depth of flow, the flow of velocity, and then estimate an erodibility index for whatever material. If that's a soil, estimate the erodibility index of that soil and use that as a, a sensitivity to, to figure out, you know, am I saying the same thing here? Calculate a stream, uh, a shear stress, and then also calculate a stream power. And if your results are similar, then you can. You're run. honing in. Yeah. 